recording on the computer. Just give us a second. Recording. Um, let it record and then. Um, Right. I'm just going to about to go live on YouTube. So one second. Let's get this started. And here we go. It's just buffering a little bit. Okay. Take a second. Good to go. All right. So we. One second. Let's setting up. <laughs> Uh, are good to go. All right, everybody. Good. Here we go. Good Just afternoon, I guess. Okay. Take a All second. Right. There we go. All right. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, on the East Coast, it's uh, about one o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, today, we are joined by a very special guest, Ron Watkins. From He's actually joining us from Pennsylvania at the moment. Um, how is it over there? Oh, it's nice. It's uh, we actually have a nice sunny day for a change, so we might get out and do some yard work. Yeah, yeah. It seems to be like we're all getting the best weather at the moment now that we're all stuck at home and in our houses. Uh, so, all right. So, my name is Duncan Brake. I'm uh, the media director from Shots for Kids, and as I said, our special guest today is Ron, um, and he is a award-winning photographer, especially specializing in underwater photography and some of our favorite toothy critters, sharks. Um, he's also an expedition leader um, and a writer, and he runs trips all around the world, um, as well as being a huge advocate for marine life conservation issues, and uh, one of the Sharks for Kids team, which is brilliant. Um, now, I'm also a little bit jealous of uh, some of the subject matter he's been able to go and uh, photograph. Um, especially the salmon sharks he's, he's well known for because uh, I'm sure he's probably going to be telling us a little bit about these amazing toothy critters at some point, but they kind of look a little bit like a great white uh, and a mako sort of got drugged through a head backwards. They're all gnarly and really, really amazing toothy critters. So I'm pretty excited to find out about them. So any of you who have an interest in underwater photography or filming or capturing images of these creatures or even how to behave around them in the water. Ron has a huge amount of experience of that. So um, listen closely to his talk. And if anybody has any questions, we're going to do it in the Q&A section. We've disabled the chat room. Um, so if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A section, um, especially questions relating to photography, shark photography, expeditions, being in the water with these amazing critters, and also maybe some conservation issues around these animals. Um, and as we're going through the talk, if I have uh, the ability to answer them, I'll be typing away and answering them on, on route. And also I'll be collecting some questions down the way for Ron to answer at the end. So, righty-ho. Um, right now, I think we'll probably get ready to hand right over to you and find out how you got started in this. Great. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, hi, everyone out there. Um, just wanted to uh, thank everyone for joining us today. Hopefully, you're making the most out of this time at home with your family. And uh, I know I sure have. I've been taking advantage of a lot of these Sharks for Kids um, webinars and some of the activities the other day. I actually drew a um, tiger shark. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, got to uh, join that session, but we're gonna do how to draw a shark again, but that was pretty cool. After seeing my drawing though, I think I'm gonna stick to photography. I'm not a real good artist like that. Um, but uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and I'll uh, kick things off. All right, uh, so today I'm going to be giving you a behind the scenes look on underwater photography and specifically what it takes to photograph sharks and what it's like. 
Um, if you, you like some of the images, you can obviously see more of them on my website. You can also follow me on Instagram. So uh, Duncan was wondering, you know, how I got into this and a little bit of background. Um, I actually started off at a very, very early age, um, you know, probably two or three in the water. Um, my dad uh, really made me sort of a water baby. And so we were always either in or around the water having a lot of fun. And when I got a little bit older, uh, if you look at this picture down in the, the bottom corner here, that's me taking my first scuba dive. Uh, at the age of 15. So uh, I had my gear on and go underwater, wasn't taking pictures back then, um, but uh, got into it and really started to take photos and share them with my, uh, with my father, my family, my friends, and then started to write and, and publish um, in different magazines and books and compete internationally in different competitions. Um, I, as Duncan mentioned, I also lead photography trips. So I teach other people how to uh, do underwater photography. And, uh, but one of the most enjoyable parts is sharing all of my images and stories with kids through Sharks for Kids. So I do a lot of those activities and uh, try to get kids interested in sharks. So one of the questions I get is, well, why do you take pictures underwater? I mean, there's plenty of stuff that you can uh, do besides take pictures. Well, one is I like to tell stories with my pictures. So Whenever I try to capture a moment in time, I really try to capture a story that really without putting any words to it, you sort of know what's going on. And then I take those stories and present those at different events, maybe uh, dive shows or Sharks for Kids events. Um, and then second, I also document. Uh, a lot of times scientists and researchers need uh, photographs and information about sharks like this salmon shark that Duncan mentioned to get more information about it and use as part of their research as well as educating others on the sharks and just really how cool they are. Um, and then from a conservation standpoint we really have to bring to the forefront and give a voice to those sharks and really all marine life and the ocean because it can't talk for itself. Well, sharks can talk, but we don't really understand what they're saying. So by presenting photos and uh, stories, then that way we can tell their story and how important they are to others and people will protect them. And then also I do have a little bit of a artistic creative side. So I, you know, like besides drawing, uh, I do like to get creative with my photography. And I really do it for the love of it. I've grown up around the ocean and just love being around the ocean, sharing, sharing my experiences with others. And a friend of mine almost told me, always shoot from the heart. And I always remember that because that's really how you get the best photos. So the other reason is it's a lot of fun, okay? I have to be honest, we get to travel to some pretty cool places. Um, and you get to go diving with your friends and you know go swimming with sharks and see all kinds of really cool marine life and then capture it with your camera. So it's a blast. Um, so, I'm going to answer this right off the bat because I usually get asked, what is your favorite shark? And I'm going to give you a couple sharks throughout today, but I have to say, and, and, and maybe you all can guess at home, I know I can't hear you, but what is the cutest shark I've ever photographed? So not necessarily my favorite, but this one's pretty close. But what is the cutest shark? Well, the little kid shark. So this is a, a, a friend of mine's uh, son and he had a cool shark outfit on. And so we took some pictures of him playing shark in the pool. So, you know, it, it doesn't always have to be in an ocean where you find these sharks. So next I'm usually asked, well, what kind of gear do you use as part of under, wait, what is this guy doing? Okay, so this uh, iguana obviously uh, is not respecting our space here, but uh, maybe the iguana is good luck. We'll see a lot of sharks today, who knows? Um, but this is a setup, a typical setup that I would go underwater with. So you can see a scuba tank and those hoses coming down are the lines that allow me to breathe. And I'm going to show you some actual gear in a second. And then in the middle, there is the camera. That big circular is the dome. And inside of it is a, is a camera that I take the pictures with. And those two white circles on each side are the strobes. And you can see my mask and my fins in the background as well. So there's all different types of camera equipment uh, for different types of photography. Sometimes you want to take pictures of little tiny critters. Um, other times you want to take pictures of big sharks like that great white. But just because you're taking pictures of something really big doesn't necessarily mean you need a big camera. So sometimes the little cameras can take just as good of pictures. 
So I'm gonna stop sharing now, and I'm gonna show you some of the camera gear. So I'm gonna turn the camera here, and I'm gonna start off with one of the easiest cameras to use, and it's a simple GoPro. So maybe some of you actually have one of these GoPros, but it's great for video and pictures. So when you're snorkeling or going swimming, you can practice in the pool. It's a great camera to start off with. Uh, the next camera I wanted to show you is the one that most people probably have around is their phone. So you can actually get a little housing for your phone and put it in an underwater housing, um, something like this one. This isn't actually for that phone, but it's for a smaller camera. And then you could take it down deeper and it'll be waterproof. So if your camera, if your phone's not waterproof, don't take it underwater. Uh, I think your parents will kill you if you do that, but put it in an underwater housing and you can. So uh, these are some of the cameras I use, but the main camera I use is this camera here. And it's, it's pretty big, pretty, pretty heavy. And so this is the side that I actually look through to take the pictures. And then this is the camera and the lens. So this glass is actually the dome port and this is completely um, underwater safe. So it's not gonna get leaks, hopefully. So let me just show you what's inside here. Turn the camera down a little bit here. So inside, this opens up, and this is really cool. I'm, a, I'm an engineer, and I really like technology. So look at all of the different gears inside this thing that control all of the buttons inside the camera. And then here's the camera itself, and we'll just take that out, and I'll show you. So here's the camera, it looks like you know, any other uh, big camera that maybe you've seen. And by putting it in this underwater housing, we can then take it underwater and take pictures and video with it. So let me set this aside. So the next item is the strobe. This is what you saw sitting on the, uh, the deck. And this is what lights up the sharks or the fish or the marine life. So watch out, there's gonna be a bright light, oh no. So that's what helps me light up things when it's dark underwater. And I'm gonna talk about light underwater a little bit different. But this attaches to the camera and you can move it around. It's sort of, think of it as a big transformer. So you can move it around and it's like a robot in disguise. It's pretty cool stuff. So that's some of the, the camera gear that I uh, use when I go out photographing sharks as an example. So I'm gonna go back to uh, sharing my screen now and we'll continue with the presentation. So why do I use those big strobes that I just showed you? Well, when you go underwater, you lose light and you don't just lose, you lose all light, you actually lose them according to the colors of the rainbow. So you kids out there that have had some of the science classes, you may have had to memorize Roy G. Biv, which stands for red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Well, that's the wavelengths and how long they are. And as you go down underwater, you, those colors start to disappear. At say 15 feet, you start to lose red. And then go down even deeper, you lose orange. And even deeper, you lose yellow until eventually you don't have anything under there. And you'll also notice the water is getting dark blue because the sunlight, which is lighting up the water, can't penetrate that deep. So you really need to introduce light into your photography. So here's an example of where I've got a shark very, very close to me. You can see I've got my strobes out there. And when I'm ready, I flash them with the light. So again, I flash them with the light. It's a very split second. It's not on for very long, but it helps freeze the action and it lights up the shark or whatever I'm taking a picture of. So on the last one, I was actually uh, scuba diving, but you don't have to use scuba gear. You can also snorkel or free dive where you're diving down and holding your breath. And here's an example where I'm doing this and I'm uh, being approached by a very friendly and curious oceanic white tip shark and taking a picture of that shark. So this was taken in Marea, French Polynesia while we were actually out looking for whales but we came across some pilot whales and next to the pilot whales, you can often find oceanic white tips. So we got to uh, swim down and it was actually the first time ever I've swam with these sharks and they are super cool. I just love the white coloration on the tips. So let's go diving and uh, let's find some more sharks. 
Uh, that sounds easy enough, right? Uh, you go in the water, you're going to see sharks. They're, they're all over. It's shark infested water is what they tell you, you know, on the internet, right? Well, actually not. Um, we're very fortunate when we get to see sharks underwater and even more fortunate when they're curious enough to come up to us and allow us to approach them to take pictures. And I'll get into some of the reasons why we don't see as many sharks later. But when we are lucky enough to see a shark, we have to approach it, approach it with caution. Um, just like you wouldn't go up to a dog um, that's on the street that's maybe growling and showing its teeth and irritated, you probably wouldn't go up to a shark that was maybe showing you some signs that it's, it's not very comfortable around you. So you have to find the right shark in the right environment and you just remain calm and give it respect that it deserves. So at that time, you can then approach the shark and hopefully it'll come towards you because if you, you can't swim after the shark, there's no way we're gonna be able to swim as fast as a shark and then take the pictures. So the next shark I wanna talk about is the largest shark species. I'm always asked, what's the biggest shark you've ever swam with and photographed? Uh, any guesses out there before I give you the answer? That's right, the whale shark. And this particular whale shark is filmed down in the Sea of Cortez. You can find them in different places all around the world, in, in typically in warmer waters. And these whale sharks are just huge. They can get up to over 40 feet long. So imagine a shark the size of your school bus and its mouth as big as the front of the school bus. That's how big these sharks are. Uh, over 40 tons sometimes, but they're very gentle sharks. They call them whale sharks because of their size and the way they feed is very similar to whales and they take, take in things uh, through their mouth and, and suck that in and then filter out uh, the food. So the next question is, and this is usually, there's always some silly, silly kid that asks, hey, what's the funniest looking shark? And, and Jillian may disagree with me because I know this is Jillian's favorite shark but I think the hammerheads are funny. I mean, they're just so cool looking, but they've got that weird hammer and they've got the eyes on the side. It almost looks like a cartoon character type shark, but they are really cool and they've evolved that way. And if you uh, were able to attend Jillian's earlier session today, she explained to you why they adapted the way they did. Um, but the hammerhead shark, this one I actually photographed down in the Cocos Islands, and this one, uh, just to give you an idea, you can see how wide that hammer is. And those uh, ampullae uh, Lorenzini, they actually are the sensors that, as she explained this morning, allow them as they swim to actually find things in the sand. And they're very, very close to their mouth. So when they can find something, they immediately can pounce on it and get their prey. Another cool feature is because of the positions on their eyes out on the ends of the hammers, they do have that 360 degree vision. So they've got some pretty cool superpowers that other sharks don't have. So maybe I shouldn't call them funny looking or silly. So what is the most famous shark? Everyone probably knows this shark. Whenever you talk about a shark, the first one that comes to mind is the great white shark. This is probably uh, one that's in the news the most. It's, there's movies on it. Um, and there's a lot of research done on great white sharks as well. This one was taken out in Guadalupe Island, Mexico. And another interesting fact about sh uh, great white sharks is they're actually considered to be one of the most intelligent sharks. And they're very inquisitive, but it's also in the way that they stalk their prey and attack their prey. They're very stealthy sharks. And, uh, you know, they're probably thinking when they see us in a cage, hey, what's, uh, you know, why are these poor little humans, you know, trapped in a cage? Are they not smart enough to get out? And so I actually get asked a lot, um, hey, were you in a cage when you took all these pictures? Well, actually, in the case of great white pictures, I've only uh, photographed them while in a cage and out at Guadalupe Island and other places they allow cage diving so that other people that maybe aren't as experienced can go down and see these sharks in person. And I guarantee if you ever get the opportunity, take it. It is a life-changing experience to see this beautiful animal in its element. It's just fantastic. But, you know, to attract these sharks, we do use bait. Um, so there's typically chum in the water. And there, this you can see there's a fish head. And that brings the sharks in because contrary to, to popular belief, if a shark is in the water with you, and if you've been in the ocean, you've probably swam with sharks, you just didn't know it. 
but sharks typically don't just come up to you. Um, so they have to be enticed to come up to you. And, you know, there's various reasons we're going to talk about later about why sharks keep their distance from you and why they're so cautious. So what is the most beautiful shark? Now this is very subjective, I know, but I happen to believe the blue shark is, I think, one of the most beautiful sharks. It has this beautiful iridescent blue color when the sunlight hits it. And the closer to the surface, it even gives it a little blue shininess. And it's just a magnificent shark. This is about a, a 10 foot uh, long blue shark that I photographed out in Southern California off the coast of Long Beach. But you can find these sharks all over the place and they're, they're just really great to interact with. Love these sharks. Now in Rhode Island, they also have blue sharks. This is the exact same shark, but uh, boy, he, he looks a lot meaner. Uh, maybe those Rhode Island sharks aren't as nice as the ones in California or something. I don't know. Well, no, actually, just like that great white, he's showing his teeth because he's going after a fish head that was just pulled out of the way. And they use that again to lure them in close to the boat so we can get some amazing photographs and see their behavior. So again, I'm asked a lot, aren't sharks dangerous? You know, what, how could you go in the water with sharks? You know, you're gonna get eaten, they're dangerous. Well, no, actually sharks aren't that dangerous. Um, we're more dangerous to sharks than sharks are to us. Um, each year, uh, humans unfortunately kill about 100 million sharks, and that's a lot of sharks, and they're doing it for things like shark fin soup. They do it as bycatch, so when they're catching different types of uh, tuna fish and other fish that you may eat, sometimes they accidentally catch sharks, and those sharks die. And then there's sport fishing tournaments and other reasons. So we're actually a lot more dangerous to sharks than sharks are to us, so that's a myth. So that being said, here's some sharks coming in and attacking me and look at how vicious they are. I'm, I'm pretending I'm on Shark Week now. Oh my gosh, here he comes. Oh, crikey, he's a big one, isn't he? Oh, oh, here, here, oh, he's coming in. He's, oh, he's giving me the stink eye, that is mean. Oh, now he's like nudging me, ouch, ouch, no, get away. Oh, this one, oh, look at it. Poor guy's got a hook in his mouth. Who would do that? That's terrible. Poor guy, he's not very aggressive. Same with this guy. He's, he doesn't want anything to do with me. Hey, come back. I want to take your picture. Oh, he's coming in fast. Oh, no, he's faking me out. Okay. So, you know, it's not too bad, I guess. Oh, now there's two of them. They're going to teen up on me and get me. Oh, no, darn, he left. So, I mean, as you see, these sharks really aren't aggressive at all. Okay. Now, some shark species are a little bit more toothy and a little bit more fast and aggressive. But a blue, this blue shark encounter is what like most of these shark encounters we, we swim with are like. So hopefully you realize, you know, from this video that these type sharks aren't aggressive. They weren't trying to bite me. They don't have hands. So the only way they can feel is with their nose and their little sensory organs and their eyes. So they want to come in and check me out. And you probably noticed that their teeth were never, ever out when they got close to me. So contrary to that first picture, they put their teeth out when they're going to eat, but they're very, very cautious and curious sharks, but they're not going to waste trying to, uh, to bite someone unless they think it's a meal. And they're smart enough to determine what's a meal and what's not a meal. So some other things that you might think about when you saw that video was uh, they were injured and hooked. So you saw some probably from fishing tournaments that, you know, had some hooks in them. That was really sad. And at the end of the video, you may have seen that they're somewhat food motivated, right? That's why they're coming in, in close to us because there's chum in the water, uh, fish stuff, and they're trying to figure out where the food is. And at the very end of the video, there was a little uh, minnow, a dead, dead minnow that was thrown in the water and one of the sharks actually got it. So, you know, I wasn't scared at all. And all the people that I brought um, shark diving with me, they're, they're not scared when they swim with these sharks. Now I will say these sharks are not exhibiting good social distancing, right? The guidelines say six feet, which is about one black tip reef shark wide or two saw sharks wide. So this one obviously was coming a little bit close. Um, but one of the cool things when they come close is you can get some amazing photographs. 
So this one is a little bit distorted because he's actually so close, but this is a blue shark. It doesn't look like your typical blue shark because of there's some trickery in the way the picture's taken. But look at how beautiful that eye is. To me, it reminds me of sort of a cat's eye. Um, it's a really, really cool, beautiful, this one has a brown eye. Here's one of those with the hooks. This one actually has two hooks. And the next species that sometimes you come across in Rhode Island is the fastest of all sharks, and that is a mako. So the makos can swim 20, up to 25 miles an hour, but they can do sudden bursts to catch their prey up to 45 miles an hour. So just as a comparison, if you have a dog that can run really fast, that dog can probably run maybe 10 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour, that's about it. So these sharks are very fast in the water. And the last shark I'm gonna talk about is my all-time favorite shark, and the one that Duncan mentioned, the salmon shark. And salmon sharks, uh, you know, there, a lot of people don't believe they exist because they think they're made up. Are they a salmon or are they a shark? And they've sort of gotten the nickname of, of, of Alaska's unicorn because a lot of people go up to Alaska to try to find these salmon sharks and they're very hard to find, let alone swim with and get pictures. So I uh, have been going up there for about three years now and I'll be going back this summer, hopefully. And uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about why I like the salmon shark. Um, one is that they're a type of mackerel shark and they feed on herring, squid, and obviously salmon. So they come up to Alaska during the salmon runs where there's, you know, thousands of salmon trying to compete to go up a, a stream. And that's where they feed. And they're related to, on the Atlantic coast, on the east coast, there's a shark called the poor beagle, which is their, their Atlantic cousin. And you may look at them and say, well, that just looks like a great white. And it, and it does at first glance, but when you look real close, you'll see their eyes are more forward and their mouth is a lot smaller. And they also have a lot of spotting and blotching on the bottom. And some of the pictures I'll be showing you will show that better. Um, but what's really cool is as, as big and bad as these sharks are, and they get to up to about 10 feet, so not quite as big as a, a great white, but they have the speed of a mako. So, some people actually think that they're capable of going over 45 miles per hour, but that has not been confirmed. So maybe some, uh, sometime on Shark Week, we can have Mako versus Salmon Shark and see who wins. So the really cool thing about these sharks is their endothermic superpower, as I like to call it. And this allows them to swim in this cold water because they exchange blood throughout their, um, throughout their body and they actually have a heat exchanger that heats their body temperature up 10 to 15 degrees. So think about if you were to go out on a cold winter day and you didn't wanna wear a jacket, you just flipped an internal switch and cranked up your body heat. That's what these sharks can do. So this allows them to swim all over the ocean and look for prey and, and hunt and cover a lot of distance. So that's pretty cool. So we do go up to Alaska to swim at these, and it is a chilly, uh, in the summer, it's about 52 degrees on the surface of the water. So it's a cold, you can actually see snow in the background. And um, unlike other sharks where you stick down, a, you put out chum slicks or you put a bait bucket out, you can't attract these sharks that way. They're, they're a little bit too smart um, for that type of attraction but you have to see their fin, like that first photo I showed you, it showed their fin. And then once you find one, you put a little fish on a line, there's no hook involved, um, and you pull the fish through the water, sort of like you play cat and mouse with a, with a little feather or something on a string with your cat at home. That's what we do with the sharks to try to cut, get them to come in close. And if they're curious in what we call a player, they'll actually chase after the bait and then come in close and try to get that bait. So that's when you can get some really, really cool photographs. And then every now and then they do get the bait. So here's one chomping down. And look at the power in that jaw, how distorted it is and how close those eyes are. And you can also tell here that the mouth is not as big as a great white, like, like I was mentioning. And you may see these things dangling off their tail and say, oh, they must be doing some fish tagging like we've talked about uh, in the previous sessions. But these are actually copepods. They're, they're a living animal that attach on and they cruise around with the shark on the tails and the fins. This image shows a, a salmon shark coming up. It's a male. Uh, it's got the claspers in the back, but it shows the beautiful, I like calling it a Dalmatian pattern almost, 
on their belly. So that's a real key characteristic of this shark. The other one is the eye. And look at the eye. It's got that little brightly colored ring around the dark center. And um, if I could zoom in, I'd actually show you, it's actually a light pale blue. And I provided some of these images to our speaker tomorrow, Megan, and she's gonna talk all about shark eyes. But these have very unique eyes, these sharks. And uh, they have very unique smiles as well. So this one's coming in, checking me out, obviously. Uh, very, very nice. And then this one's smiling at me, you know. He's like, hey, how's it going? And again, he's coming in not to be aggressive. He's coming in looking for that little minnow that we've been playing with him um, throughout the day. So again, not aggressive sharks at all. All right, kids, uh, just because you're at your home does not mean that you escape the pop quiz. So I hope you all have been paying attention. Uh, I know we've got a lot of questions too. So pop quiz question number one, what is the largest species of shark? All right, that's right, it is the whale shark. So the whale shark can get up to 40 feet and larger, huge, huge shark. Question number two, what is the fastest shark? You might think this is a trick question, but it is a mako. Uh, you know, it hasn't been proved that the salmon shark is faster yet, but I think, I'd like to think it is. We'll have to see someday. And what kind of gear do you need to photograph sharks? Cameras and housings, strobes and flashes, scuba gear, mask and snorkel? That's right, all of the above. And the last question, and this one is extra credit, all right? So I know some of you out there are really good students. What is your favorite shark? And you may have a favorite shark, but I bet you don't know that there's over 500 sharks. And so for you to really understand all the sharks, a good thing to do is to go on the Sharks for Kid website, and we have fast facts and coloring sheets for a lot of sharks. So go up there and check them out, read about the different sharks, and then decide which one is your favorite shark and why. So with that, I just wanted to thank all of you. And really the best part of being an underwater photographer is being able to share and talk with the kids as part of Sharks for Kids. I really enjoy that and I hope everyone got a lot of good information and enjoyed today's presentation. So with that, we'll go ahead and I'll stop sharing and we can turn things over to Duncan for the Q&A session. All right, let me see. Um, we'll just start the video right now. Perfect, cool. All right, thank you very much, Ron. Uh, very, <laughs> very, very jealous of some of those images. Fantastic <laughs> images. Um, definitely need to see some of those critters in the future. Uh, really, we'll, really have to, we'll have to go diving together and uh, yeah. see them together. <laughs> yeah, I'd love that, especially when we get locked <laughs> out of the house, for sure. Um, yeah. All right. We had a bunch of amazing questions and uh, we answered a few of them on route. And I actually have a, uh, a few more um, to ask you in person. We did get a very strange one from uh, somebody called Grayson, who was actually wondering if sharks uh, were immune to COVID-19. That's something that we've been asked a few times. Uh, it's very hard for us to actually have an answer for that because we're unaware of the exposure to these amazing critters. Yeah, that's a tough one. It's, it's a myth. It is a myth that a lot of sharks are immune to cancers and things like that. that ca sharks can get sick, contrary to some of those urban legends. Cool. So, um, all right. First of all, from Cade, we have, how do you get on a trip with Ron? So some, if somebody was interested on coming on a trip with you, how would you... Excellent. So, so I assume that's Cade from Cade Save Sharks, which is one of the coolest kids I know and does so much for sharks. So you don't have to be older to be a shark advocate. But good question, Cade. So I do lead trips um, and I have them on my website, Ron Watkins Photography, and I, I lead those trips to different locations. Um, and so this year, as I mentioned, I'm going to Alaska and I'm going to Fiji and then next year going to the Philippines. Um, going to Socorro. So you can always keep an eye on that uh, for all the different trips I'm leading or just drop me an email if there's some place uh, you're interested in. Even if I'm not leading a trip, I can usually help you get to the right people to take you out safely and have fun. Cool. Very, very cool. All right. And then from Loriana, um, she was wondering um, what advice would you give to somebody uh, who's wanting to like 
start getting into sort of underwater photography or photographing sharks in general? Like what, what's sort of the basic starting points? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, I think everyone has a different story, um, how they got into underwater photography. Um, first, you, you need to uh, have a love of the water and be, be comfortable in the water. Um, some people get into photography first. So before you're scuba diving and snorkeling, you can always have a camera and practice photography. Uh, there's lots of resources to learn photography. Um, but if you want to start taking pictures underwater, you can actually start in your swimming pool with some of the, the simple cameras I, I spoke about. You can then go snorkeling. Um, there is no age restriction on snorkeling. Just get your parents to take you out. And then as you get a little bit older, I, I don't know the exact age, I think maybe 12-ish uh, you can get certified, maybe even a little younger. Um, but you can get a certification and go scuba diving. So I really um, think if you're, before you ever take a camera underwater scuba diving, you need to become a good scuba diver. Because if you remember that photograph of the photographer, um, she was really just standing still and letting a shark come in. So you have to become comfortable underwater first and then you can take really good images. And Duncan may have some more comments because he's uh, an accomplished videographer and photographer as well. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 as Ron mentioned, it's, everybody has their own story and their own, uh, own path, uh, to getting there. Some people go through the conventional method of going through photography classes in school and other people have come to it very organically. But the great thing in this day and age is that, um, we're living in an age where everybody has cameras, access to cameras. So even if you're not underwater, I think our best bit of advice we can give you is just, if you've got a creative eye, start using those cameras start taking images around the world and getting some shots um and you can approach you can approach a shark like any piece of wildlife that you may encounter um sort of learn its behaviors and learn how it's kind of approaching you and figuring you out um and even even if you've got a dog or a cat like you know like see as the cat's walking around the house and how it's approaching you and then all of a sudden it decides to turn and move off it's like learn the way those animals approach you and eventually once you've figured out their behavioral patterns it's very similar to working in the wild with these amazing critters like the sharks as you you figure out how they behave around you and how to get those best images because i'm sure ron will probably uh attest to um we've all had a fair fair share of shark bums uh in photographs and videos where the shark turns and all you get is the tail going away yeah. Right. So well, for every one of those pictures that I showed you today, there's literally hundreds <laughs> that I would never show you or anyone else. And uh, Duncan brings up a good point, you know, start learning a lot. And then I, I was living in Arizona uh, for many years. And so Arizona, there's there's no oceans nearby. So I actually photographed kids in, in swimming pools and underwater. And I photographed over 400 kids. And I will say photographing a kid swimming around being crazy in the water is about as unpredictable as a shark in the water sometimes. So it's good practice to, uh, to, to just photograph not only sharks, but whatever you have to photograph. Cool. Um, all right, so uh, Pascal Lafleur had uh, asked us um, your favorite shark to photograph. Now, I presume this might be the same as your favorite shark, the salmon shark. Um, so if it is, what about your uh, least favorite shark to photograph? Yeah, um, well, I, I could also say least favorite is the salmon shark because they're so darn hard to find. Um, in three years of going up there, I've only spent 45 total minutes in the water with them. So it's a lot of time not photographing them. Um, but I do really like blue sharks. Um, they are so curious and playful and you can capture so many different types of images of them. Um, and they just have the coolest little personalities. I, I think of them as like puppy dogs in the water. So they're really, really cool. They're usually fairly, I don't want to say easy to find, but um, there's places you can go that you're going to most likely find those sharks. Um, so those are pretty, pretty cool sharks to photograph. Very cool. Cheeky little blue sharks. I love yeah. Um, put your eye on them. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, I bet. Quite squirrely. Um, okay, so Ollie and quite a few other people um, ask this question, which is, what is the best camera for underwater photography? Now, I'll probably stagger that into two questions for you. Um, what would you recommend is the best camera to start underwater photography? 
with if you're kind of thinking on a budget range and then what would in your opinion be the best camera before? good good question and i'm asked this a lot and the answer i always give is the camera that you have and uh what i mean by that is learn how to use the camera you've got there's things that it does really really well and maybe some limitations but learn how to use that. Learn the basics of aperture, shutter, ISO, how all those things interact. Learn composition. It doesn't matter if it's a hundred dollar camera or several thousand dollar camera. You need to learn the basics. Um, and, and this is bad because I actually work with a photography company and we try to sell lots of cameras, but usually people get in caught buying the new camera, the new latest and greatest things. And uh, the, it's not the camera that takes the picture, it's the photographer. So you gotta know your gear. Um, but if I was starting off and once I'm, you know, an accomplished diver and comfortable underwater, you know, I would probably start off, there's my uh, camera. Um, there's one like this one here. It's, it's an Olympus. Um, this one without a housing or anything uh, can go down to 50 feet. And then you can put it in this housing and it, there's lenses that can go on it. And you can tape it even deeper. But this one's a nice one because you can grow with it and it is a compact camera, but it has a lot of controls that you can control on it. And it's got a nice price point as entry. Um, and then the other, probably the simplest is the GoPro uh, getting started. Um, but then it really goes up from there and what you want to do, what type of photography you want to specialize in. And that's going to dictate. Um, I would say um, invest in nice lighting. Um, those strobes that I showed you are really important um, because that's what really helps create some of those images. Um, but whether you shoot Nikon, Canon, my, my wife shoots Canon, I shoot Nikon, you know, um, Olympus, Sony, there's so many great cameras out there and there's some good forums um, that you can look at. Um, Dive Photo Guide has great reviews of cameras, you could check them out. Uh, obviously Backscatter has reviews of cameras as well. So there's lots of resources, but you got to look at your budget and what you want to do with it. But whatever camera you have, make the most of it. Awesome, great. So uh, let me see what else we've got here. Um, Reese Rob and quite a few others uh, kind of had variants of this similar sort of question, which was um, when you are taking photographs of sharks, um, how do they not harm you or attack you or even take a cheeky nibble of your camera? How does that not happen? Yeah, well, I mean, you've got to pay attention to them for one thing. So uh, Duncan mentioned earlier, you got to understand their behavior. So, um, you know, I wouldn't get in the water with a shark not understanding a little bit about it. Um, so before, as an example, I, I did a lot of research on salmon sharks before going up there. I looked at um, other people's video footage, photography, learned as much as I could. Um, same with that oceanic white tip. We actually, um, there were a number of us uh, on the boat, there were six of us, and not everyone went in because not everyone was comfortable. So you have to be comfortable because if you get in the water and you're not comfortable and you're flailing around your arms, that can cause some trouble. Sharks are curious, they're going to come in and that white fleshy arm might look like a minnow to them. Um, so you really need to have the proper gear. So, you know, we have hoods on that are black. We have gloves on that are black. So we don't want anything flashy and shiny is one thing. You definitely don't want to make a lot of sudden movements because that will attract a shark. So that's why you just have to be in your Zen moment and let the sharks come into you. Um, and you need to be able to read sharks. Um, earlier, I think it was last week, we, 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 we heard, uh, I think it was from Yanis, talked about the language and social communication of sharks and how they'll put their pectoral fins down and they'll sort of swim in tight circles, put their nose up. So those are things just like I used the dog example. If the dog's wagging its tail and it's got its tongue out, I'd probably go up and put my hand out and give it a nice petting. But if it's growling and, and, and you know, not looking so nice at that, you might want to ask the owner if you can pet it. So great awesome um time for a couple more questions let's sure. see what we've got um blah, blah, blah. Oh, oh this is quite interesting um so i'll explain drift diving for people who are unaware what drift diving is is usually when you're scuba diving when there's a lot of current um there can be so much current that you can't physically kick and stay in position at once 
um, so that current's just taking you from A to B. So usually what happens on a drift dive is people drop you in the water and you ride that current to another point and then come up and usually a boat picks you up or something like that. And the question that was asked was, how can you even take photos and pictures um, during a drift dive? Is there any tips or tricks that you could give? Yeah, that, that is, that's a really, really good question. Um, and those are very challenging um, situations. And one of the things I teach in my photo classes is you have to be comfortable in your environment before you even think about taking a photo. So if it's your first drift dive ever, um, or you're not experienced in drift diving, I'd leave the camera on the boat and just enjoy the dive, get comfortable with it. Uh, once you're comfortable with it, then if the sharks and things are coming like that, one of the first shot, shots I showed you, it was a black and white shark shot where I showed the flashes going off. Um, that was in a drift dive in uh, French Polynesia on one of the passes. And so, as you saw, I, I wasn't in a normal position like this. I was, I was sort of vertical like that and just chilling and the sharks were coming in and checking us out and taking the picture. Um, other places like the Cocos, Palau, um, you can actually either latch on with a, a reef hook, which is a, a line that goes to your, your VC, your, your vest, and it latches in, and so you basically sail above the reef um, safely and not damage things that much, and then take pictures and let the sharks come in. Um, also in Cocos, it's, it's not really a reef, it's more of a rock, and if you have gloves on, in Galapagos it's the same thing, you can grab on and hold on for dear life, and sometimes you have to use both hands to hold on, so you, you don't have a free hand to take a picture, but you sort of get behind things and sneak out, take your picture and come back. And it is tricky. That is one of the most challenging environments. That hammerhead shark shots that I showed you were taken uh, in extreme current at Cocos. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. And it's, it's a very good point that Ron brought up as well is make sure you're comfortable in your own skin before you start adding the equipment in the water as well. Uh, a big thing is controlling your buoyancy, allowing yourself to figure out, especially with video, is allowing those shots to stay smooth. And, and also think about this object. You may start going in the water with quite a small camera, but some of the bigger cameras that we have in the water, they actually act like big sails. So they're like exactly. objects. And sometimes they're quite difficult to move and push against the current. Cool. So we have one last question from uh, Theo age six, which I quite like this question. Have you ever met a shark that did not want to be photographed? Huh. <laughs> well, I mean, the salmon shark, I don't know if it doesn't want to be photographed. It's just really shy. Um, sharks tend to be pretty darn skittish. And um, sometimes at night, um, your flashes, you might get one shot off of a shark. And, it's, and I, I guess those hammerheads down in Cocos are a good example. They're, they, they're very cautious. And even though it's current and you think they'd come swimming up to you, they'll see your bubbles and they'll stay away from you. So uh, if you're holding on and not going up or down, you, you really sort of need to just hang tight and not breathe as much and allow them to come close. But boy, after those strobes go off once or twice, that shark just swims away very very fast so sometimes you only have one shot at getting the image um, so yeah those those are pretty skittish sharks uh, and then sometimes when you go to a location that is not real uh, heavily traveled and the sharks maybe don't see many divers um, you know some of the sharks can be more skittish there too but uh, for the most part sharks you know uh, as long as you respect them they'll respect you they'll Come in close if you're comfortable and you know you can get some really nice photos awesome well thank you very much ron that's uh excellent uh talk and very informative i think i've learned a few new things <laughs> Great. As well, which Great. is pretty cool oh so a bit of a light flicker going on um all right so i think we're going to figure out how to share the screen yeah, for the website. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna pass Jillian on for. All right. On the I'm just gonna slide in, but yeah. So thank you guys again um, for joining us for all the webinars and and especially uh, this one. Uh, make sure to stay tuned. We do have another one tomorrow um, and next week as well. We're going to be running these for at least the next three to four weeks. And if a lot of the questions uh, we didn't get a chance to answer and there's some really great ones. So I'm just going to pull up real quick um, the website so you guys can 
have a look, if you go to sharksforkids.com, uh, I'm gonna share screen, okay. So you can see here, uh, let me just pull it over. So you have webinars is under the education. So you can see coming soon. You can also see the previously recorded, including Ron's talk will be up there shortly on our YouTube channel. Um, there's different options to get involved, uh, options for teachers, any teachers watching. We have lots of curriculum activities for students, coloring sheets. Uh, I believe there's a salmon chart coloring sheet. So you can actually check that out as well. We've been talking about them a lot, different events. Um, ways to get involved. So uh, definitely have a, an explore um, and, and send us any questions. If you have another question, you don't find an answer in some of our fast fact sheets about different species. I saw some of the questions. Um, you can find a lot of information there. Um, if you don't uh, see your answer in there, but feel free um, to actually just send us a message through the website. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, Ron, for your time and all the incredible information. And thanks to everybody who joined us today and ask their questions. Uh, thank you guys so much. Have a great afternoon.